That doesn't even count insurance, maintenance, or the cost of the car. American families are in desperate need of help this summer. Today we will begin the first in a series of three hearings that the Select Committee will conduct over the next two weeks to examine the Democratic New Direction Energy Plan that will not only provide consumers with immediate relief from skyrocketing energy prices, but also to provide long-term solutions that will reduce our energy dependence and help our economy. The Bush administration continues to oppose Democratic proposals that will provide consumers with relief right now and put us on a path to a renewable energy future in the long run. Our nation's strategic petroleum reserve currently contains more than 706 million barrels of oil and is filled to over 97 percent of its capacity, the highest level in its history. More than two weeks ago, Speaker Pelosi called on President Bush to take action to immediately lower oil prices by deploying oil from this reserve. Each day that passes without the Bush administration taking action is another day that American families and our economy fall deeper into crisis. We cannot afford to wait any longer. Deploying oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve has driven down prices when it has been used in the past. In 1991, when President Bush's father deployed oil from the reserve, oil prices fell 33.4 percent. In 2000, President Clinton conducted a time exchange of oil from the SPR, and prices again immediately dropped by 18.7 percent. And in 2005, when President Bush himself released oil following Hurricane Katrina, prices fell 9.1 percent. That is an average drop in the price of oil of 19.2 percent. If we experienced a similar impact now, it would mean a $25 reduction in the price of oil. But President Bush and Republican leaders in Congress continue to oppose releasing oil to help consumers. Instead, President Bush proposes giving away our nation's beaches and wilderness areas to big oil. The Bush administration's own Energy Department has stated that drilling off our coast and in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge will not produce any oil for 10 years and will have an insignificant impact on prices 20 years from now. So all that the President Bush, Vice President Cheney and other Republican leaders in Washington have to offer to consumers who are being shaken down at the pump on a daily basis are the same tired drilling schemes that won't provide any relief whatsoever for 10 to 20 years. That is the agenda of the American Petroleum Institute, not the American people. In contrast, Democrats in Congress want to provide American families with help in the next 10 to 20 days by deploying our nation's oil reserve. While President Bush is willing to deploy our National Guard reserves to protect oil fields abroad, he continues to refuse to deploy our Strategic Petroleum Reserve to protect American consumers here at home. The Strategic Petroleum Reserve is a powerful weapon that the American people have against big oil, OPEC, and the speculators and manipulators that are driving up prices. And it is time for President Bush to use it. Let me now uh, stop and turn to recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will insert my opening statement in the record. However, I will make a couple of quick comments. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome our witnesses. I particularly want to help Mr. May, who is, I know, working aggressively to help the airline industry. My hometown is the uh, base of an important airline in this nation, and I know that the airlines have been uh, crushed. Uh, by the sudden spike in fuel prices. Um, I really hadn't ha intended to get partisan in this discussion. Uh, however, listening to you, Mr. Chairman, I feel somewhat compelled to do so. Uh, certainly, I, uh, I believe the SPRO is one possible avenue. I voted for uh, not putting any more oil into it earlier this year. I think acknowledging that, the, that either not putting more oil into the Strategic Petroleum Reserve or uh, taking some oil out of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is an intellectual acknowledgment that increasing supply uh, will have an effect on prices, indeed that there is a link between supply and prices. And you say the President is not willing to release oil from uh, the SPRO and therefore that is damaging. I would turn the tables on you and say, regrettably, your party is unwilling to do anything about sp supply other than the SPRO. And I would note that in the testimony of one of our witnesses, when the President earlier uh, last week, I believe on Monday or Tuesday, 
uh, announced that he was willing to open the Outer Continental Shelf, which we have put off sh limits. Uh, and we put off limits back when gasoline prices were $1.30 or $1.40 a gallon. We continue to keep it off limits from any further production or exploration now that gasoline is $4.12 a gallon. But when the president uh, lifted the executive branch uh, limit restriction on uh, Outer Continental Shelf drilling, there was a drop of $6.48 in the price of a barrel of oil uh, on the very next day, the single largest drop in the price of oil in any one day since 1991. Uh, I don't think this is an issue on which we ought to be partisan. I think this is an issue on which we need to be uh, very concerned about American consumers, particularly about those consumers who are in the worst financial position, the people who drive the oldest cars uh, because they can't afford newer, more efficient cars, the people who live the furthest from work because they can't afford to live near where they work. And quite frankly, we need to be deeply concerned about the American economy. Uh, it does not serve this nation for us as politicians to be throwing partisan shots back and forth at each other while American businesses, for example, the American airline business, uh, are suffering when they have to compete with foreign competitors. Uh, the weak dollar is an issue in this debate. Uh, some people believe speculation is an issue in this debate. And I think anybody with any rationality understands that the tight situation between supply and demand uh, is a part of this problem. If we don't address uh, at, at least every conceivable pro aspect of this issue and do everything we can, we're not serving the American people well. Uh, for that reason, I do commend you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and look forward to the testimony of our witnesses. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing, and I thank the witnesses for being here. Um, I just want to recall that the other day, I, while I was being interviewed by Fox News, they asked me, uh, the anchor person asked me if there was really a crisis going on and if we should really be dipping into the SPRO. And I said, when is it not a crisis when our people have to pay 460 or more a gallon and people are losing their businesses? And I'm talking about people from a district like mine where we've seen prices as high as $4 for the last eight months and we see no relief, and we find that a good number of them, a good proportion, are spending about 12 percent of their income just on transportation. Many who are transit dependent, but many who are driving older cars. This, did not, this crisis did not come upon us because of uh, Democrats taking over the House a year ago. This came about because of our lack of investment in renewable energies. And yesterday, I had the um, opportunity to hear Mr. Uh, T. Bone Pickens talk about renewable sources, and I was quite surprised to hear what he had to say. Very enlightened, in fact, that these are other uh, issues that we need to be focusing in on. It's not, it can't just be about oil dependency, and I think the public and even people from districts like mine get it. They know that we have to change our course, and we are large consumers of fossil fuels, and we need to change that. And we do care about our planet and the uh, climatic action that's going on. We see a hurricane that's going to hit right now in uh, Mexico and Texas. It's further going to, I think, erode our, our ability to uh, obtain uh, more fossil fuel there. Um, but I think we need to be looking and investing in other alternatives. And that's what the new direction in Congress is looking at. So I thank our witnesses and look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Great. General ladies, time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I uh, appreciate the opportunity for us to explore with our witnesses the implications of deploying the Strategic Petroleum Reserve now. Uh, given in the course of the last year, we have essentially doubled the price of a barrel of oil on the world market, there's been, what, a 2 percent increase in world demand. There's something else going on here. Um, I seriously doubt that the prospect of uh, some oil supply 20 years from now on the outer shelf or someplace else uh, in the United States uh, was responsible for a, uh, a reduction of uh, $6 a barrel. I think the fact that we have been uh, having serious discussion with Speaker Pelosi and others, including yourself, Mr. Chairman, about uh, the wisdom of the redeployment of a small amount of this oil to signal uh, where we're going and uh, the fact that uh, over the course of the next uh, two or three months uh, there could be uh, a deployment of a small amount of that reserve 
but disrupting some of the strategies of people who would manipulate the market, um, I think is very, very important. And I appreciate uh, your leadership and that of the Speaker zeroing in on this. I look forward to exploring further with our witnesses. I think this is part of a multifaceted approach in the short term to try and squeeze the speculative bubble, uh, because there's clearly, whether it's $10 a barrel or $70 a barrel, I don't know. The witnesses we've heard uh, before this committee and others have um, not been in agreement, but there's clear that that is part of the issue. Put in place with a comprehensive approach to energy uh, broadening our sources wherever they are and not being reliant on a pet, uh, fossil fuel petroleum based economy. I welcome the call from the uh, former Vice President uh, about setting our sights high. It is something you and the Speaker have been doing. I look forward to exploring these elements with our witnesses in a few moments. Thank you very much. Thank the gentleman. The Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Well, I am not is this on? Yeah, it is on. Okay, my, the little button is not working. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for the hearing. And uh, our witnesses, I thank you very much for being with us today. We are looking forward to visiting with you and hearing what you have to say on uh, the issue and on uh, the release of uh, the portion of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve should that be undertaken. But I will tell you, that is an action that I do not support. I don't think that oil should be taken out of the SBR unless there is a genuine emergency where supplies have been cut off. And I think the situation that we face with uh, instability in the Middle East um, shows us that an SBR release would not be the wisest move that we could make at this point. I think this issue is very different than when Congress passed a bill with my support to stop filling the SPR. This brought more oil supply to the market. It did not significantly affect our emergency supply, and it provided temporary immediate relief to the American consumer. But what really is behind this initiative is, I think, the failure of the majority's leadership to have a comprehensive or a rational energy policy. And they are not listening to what my constituents and certainly what most Americans are uh, saying and what they are demanding of us when it comes to energy policy. They want us, the American people want us to get to work on this and to do something that is going to affect long term. They want us to drill here, drill now. They want to end up paying less. So I am looking forward to hearing what you have to say today and appreciate the fact that we are having the hearing to approach the issue. I yield back. Great. The uh, gentlelady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Anderson. I would just like to say I think a small release from the SPRO is entirely appropriate. But I want to respond to this sort of continuum canard that somehow Democrats aren't for increasing supply of energy. In fact, we are for an increasing supply of energy as proposed by famous Republican uh, T-Bone Pickens who addressed our caucus yesterday and said we got enormous amounts of energy blown in the wind. A fellow who just invested $4 billion of building the world's largest wind turbine farm in Texas. What Democrats are for is to really expand uh, uh, our source of energy, but not just in oil. And, and uh, we are seeing the DOE that has told us we can have 20 percent of our electricity from electricity that can power our cars. And this is the great vision that Democrats have of powering our cars with electricity, either through the use of lithium ion batteries or through, as T. Boone Pickens has suggested, dis displacing it and use natural gas and use natural gas for cars rather than residential. You can argue about which one is going to win the race, natural gas or lithium ion batteries. But Democrats are providing a vision for more energy. We know there is not enough energy off of our coastline to make an appreciable difference in the price of fuel because it is less than one half a percent of world oil supplies. But we also know that we are blessed uh, with enormous supplies of energy in wind, in our water, in our sunshine, in our engineered geothermal. And these are the sources of energy that finally can break the slavery that we now are suffering under to oil. 
And the only way to break slavery in these chains of this addiction to provide new sources of energy that are not oil. We are for increasing supply in the places where we can really make a difference, and we're going to get that job done. Thanks. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today's uh, hearing is both timely and important. Uh, I believe that the uh, Strategic Petroleum Reserve is the exact right tool to go after speculators and to make sure that uh, the market uh, is being controlled in a, in a strategic way. Um, we don't need to use very much of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, small amounts, uh, 5 million barrels uh, once a week or once a month should discourage speculation. But I want to hear it from the experts to understand what you think is possible and how you think that will affect the market uh, and uh, if you think that that will discourage speculation uh, and if so, uh, how and if not, uh, what can we do to make sure that it does. Um, so I welcome your testimony. Uh, in, in my district, we have seen some of the highest prices of gasoline in the nation. People are definitely hurting. Uh, in fact, I have to drive over a very large district, so I feel the pain from high price of gasoline. So we all want to find a solution. I, I don't think it, in, it, uh, it, it enhances the problem by pointing fingers at each other, but uh, it does enhance it by discussing uh, rationally what the future will look like, how we can use the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, and what other long-term objectives we need to, uh, to go after. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would echo uh, Mr. Inslee's remarks and say I personally am, uh, I don't own any drilling equipment, but I, I'm not stopping anybody from drilling. In fact, I'm, I'd be very happy if the oil companies would drill on the 68 million acres they've already leased and permitted in the lower 48 and adjacent uh, offshore plots. But that can't be and won't be the long-term solution because we just don't have, and in fact, the world will not have enough oil to last forever. In New York this morning, gas prices are averaging 4.2. To seven, four dollars and twenty-seven cents. In some places, four dollars and fifty cents. Like the rest of the country, they have been high for weeks. And in the last week, as the price of crude fell, the price of gasoline at the pump continued to climb. Once again, showing the disconnect that I think should be looked into by the CFC uh, uh, Consumer Products uh, Trading Commission. Uh, in an area like ours, where commuting is not so much a lifestyle choice as it is a necessity, this is an economic squeeze for families that are already being squeezed by higher consumer costs. We didn't dig our way into this hole overnight, and we need to keep pushing the visionary new solutions that this committee and this Congress have tried to adv advance. President Bush has often alluded to the fact that he can't simply wave a magic wand to make gas prices go down. But in fact, he does have a magic wand to give us some slack immediately, the SPR. A release of oil from the SPR is a tested, proven, secure, and effective method of calming markets and lowering prices. The last three presidents have successfully used SPR oil to head off serious economic damage and dangerous record spikes. I would also note that the oil in the SPR has been put there through the Royalty in Kind program for exploration on public, public lands, meaning that the oil in the SPR is the American people's oil and the administration should use it to help them now. Today, I look forward to hearing from our panelists about the best way to do, to do just that, and I yield back. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired, and all time for opening statements has been completed. We will now turn to our first witness, Mr. Kyle Simpson, <clears throat> who is currently the Policy Director for Brownstein, Hyatt, Faber and Schreck. Mr. Simpson has formerly served in a number of positions at the Department of Energy including Associate Deputy Secretary of Energy and Senior Policy Advisor to the Secretary. In those roles, Mr. Simpson's responsibilities included policy development and direction for the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Uh, we thank you for being here today, Mr. Simpson. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning uh, to the members of the committee, and thank you for asking me to appear here today. The history of market reaction to releases of crude oil from the reserve shows that strategically deploying oil from the SPR is good public policy and can have an immediate beneficial impact on crude oil, gasoline and other petroleum product prices. SPR experience also shows that the downturn of gasoline and other prices is apt to occur with the mere announcement or anticipation of an announcement of a release. 
I will focus on some of the details of the results of the actions taken by the Reserve, including the release of oil before the first Gulf War, the announcement of the sale in 1996, the 2000 exchange of oil, and the announcement of a release after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Each of these releases from the Reserve are good examples of the implications that can uh, be the result of a, re of a release. They provide insights into the results of actions by the Reserve in response to real, anticipated, or perceived oil, and in some cases, product supply shortages, or to send messages to overly heated markets that the U.S. government is prepared to use the Reserve to protect consumers. The sale of oil from the SPR in concert with the first Gulf War was announced on January 16, 1991, in anticipation of the impending conflict. The disruption on which the finding was based had not actually occurred. In the face of impending military conflict, the administration utilized the SPR's anticipatory authorities for the drawdown. On January 17th, the price of oil fell from $32.25 to $21.48 and stabilized. In the Omnibus Appropriations Act for 1996, the Congress directed DOE to sell $227 million worth of oil to achieve the overall budget target for the year. At that time, retail gasoline prices were climbing. Shortly after the law was enacted, President Clinton implemented the sale of approximately 12 million barrels from the SPR. The decision to sell the oil immediately resulted in a downturn in gasoline prices on April 29 and 30 that continued through the first week of October of that year. The principal impact of the announced sale was psychological, temporarily halting the bullish pressures in the market and led to a reversal in both crude and product prices. Selling oil is not the only way uh, the SPR can be used to help alleviate uh, price problems. In 2000, home heating oil inventories were extremely low and President Clinton gave then Secretary Bill Richardson the authority to exchange 30 million barrels from the SPR to the market. As a result, as the chairman pointed out in his opening statement, oil prices dropped 34% by the end of the year, going from $30.94 to $20.38 per barrel. After Hurricane Katrina, uh, prices began to rise very dramatically because of disruptions in productive capacity in the Gulf. On September 2, 2005, President George W. Bush issued a finding of severe energy supply interruption and directed the Secretary to withdraw and sell oil from the Reserve. The announcement uh, of, after the announcement, and that in each of these cases, it's the announcement that causes the price to change. Uh, the actual movement of oil occurs weeks later. Uh, the price dropped from 69.50 to 66.91 the next day and continued a steady decline for several months. The price did not exceed the peak until April of 2006. Uh, at that point, the f refilling of the reserve was suspended for another year. Uh, it's difficult to know the exact impact uh, of, a, of, a, of a release, but as these releases indicate, the psychological impact and the fact that more oil is going into the market causes the price, has caused the price to go down for extended periods of time. Um, it has to be a substantial amount uh, of a release in order to have that effect, uh, but I think some of the proposals that are being considered today uh, or by the Congress uh, would be substantial. I also want to point out that you have a unique opportunity to utilize the SPR uh, to address the current energy crisis in a way that can add to significant funding for new alternative uh, energy, clean energy for the future. Uh, if you took the GAO as advice uh, to release oil, light oil from the reserve, which is all it contains right now, in contrast to the for some 40 percent of heavy oil that our refining industry uses, uh, today and did an exchange over time and allowed the department to, to make decisions as to when that oil would be, would be so, so released and when it would be brought back, the price differential that GAO has estimated is about $12 a barrel between light and heavy oil. If you monetized that differential over uh, the the 70, uh, 70 million barrels, you could bring in more than $800 million into the government that, the, that is not anticipated under the current budget and use that 
for many purposes, but one that I would suggest would be as a down payment on the next generation of clean domestic energy resources. Um, I see that I'm about to run out, have run out of time, so I would uh, just want to point that out and uh, make those suggestions. I hope the history of the reserve has been helpful, and I thank you for asking me to, to come today. Thank you, Mr. Simpson, uh, very much. Our next uh, witness is uh, Dr. Joe Rome, who is a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. Uh, he also served in the Department of Energy in a number of capacities, including Acting Assistant Secretary and Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Energy Efficiency and Renewable uh, Energy. He has written extensively on the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. We welcome you, Dr. Rome. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, I have three main points. First, we tried offshore drilling in 2006 and oil prices doubled. Uh, second, the only plausible remaining strategy for reducing oil prices quickly is opening up the Strategic Petroleum Reserve uh, while making a major push for oil conservation. Third, I think we're going to sell off the Strategic Reserve by mid-century anyway. So why not do it now when consumers need the relief and we can use the money to help end our oil addiction? Uh, we must be honest with the public. Oil prices are headed much higher over the next five to ten years unless we jumpstart the transition to low-cost alternative fuels, something even oil man T. Boone Pickens has said. Some insist that more offshore drilling will lower prices, but that is the one strategy we know has failed. We tried opening up most of the Gulf of Mexico to offshore drilling two years ago, but oil prices have doubled since then. Ending the moratorium on coastal drilling, where there is maybe one-fifth the oil already available for drilling in the Gulf offers no realistic hope for reducing oil prices. Indeed, the Bush administration's own energy experts have made the same point. But selling a relatively modest amount of crude oil from the Strategic Reserve while promoting oil conservation could pop the speculative bubble and lower oil prices. It worked very well when President Bush's father did it during Desert Storm, as you heard uh, from Kyle and as my uh, chart in the testimony shows, hopefully someone will flip that chart over there. Uh, we, uh, as Kyle said, we only, uh, un uh, the President merely announced that he would sell 34 million barrels. And as you could see, oil that had started to, to spike up in price immediately collapsed, and it was about a, a one-third drop uh, over the course of a day or two. Uh, so, what so imagine what would happen if uh, the current President Bush announced that he would announce today he was going to sell three times as much oil, 90 million barrels, over the next six months at the rate of 500,000 barrels a day. I uh, advocate combining that sale with a strong push for oil conservation. Uh, this president, or more realistically, the next president, uh, should use his bully pulpit to launch a national oil conservation education campaign urging consumers and businesses to take a variety of steps to reduce gasoline use. That could easily double the oil uh, provided by the Strategic Reserve. Now, if oil prices did drop uh, as a result of these actions, as I expect, then obviously that would vindicate this strategy. Uh, but if oil prices did not drop, that would merely demonstrate how useless the Strategic Reserve was in the first place. Uh, and, you know, I, I try to make this point in my testimony. The Strategic Reserve is not strategic. It was created at a time when people worried that countries could withhold oil from us. But now we have a global market, so that isn't possible. We have replaced the possibility of oil shortages with the reality of rising prices. So if we don't use the Strategic Reserve to deal with our current price spike, when would we ever use it? Uh, indeed, I've asked people all the time, name me a scenario in which we would use the Strategic Reserve, any significant fraction of it. Um, after all, in the entire three-decade history of the Strategic Reserve, a mere 32 million barrels were sold during crises. Uh, and we now have 700 million barrels. So we're not, and I, I think we're not going to keep this relatively useless reserve for many more decades. As you know better than anyone, Mr. Chairman, we need to be almost completely off of oil by mid-century to avoid catastrophic global warming. So sometime soon we're going to sell off the Spro's oil because I can't imagine the taxpayers and, and their representatives are going to seriously sit on $100 billion uh, sitting under the mattress forever. It's just, it's not going to happen. We're going to sell it off, so why not do it now when we can use the price relief and we could generate tens of billions of dollars this year uh, and in coming years. Some of that could help low-income families deal with high energy bills and some could jumpstart the transition to a clean energy economy and end our oil addiction. 
Gasoline prices are headed much, much higher unless we uh, begin an aggressive switch to the only domestic alternative fuel that is both abundant and much cheaper than gasoline, uh, namely electricity. We need to start spending billions of dollars accelerating the deployment of plug-in hybrids, energy efficiency, recycled energy, wind power, solar photovoltaics, and solar baseload. In conclusion, some argue that oil prices will drop if we end the federal moratorium on coastal drilling, even, that, even though that would only deliver maybe 100,000 barrels of oil a day sometime after 2020. And I just don't understand how, how anyone can believe in more coastal drilling and oppose releasing 500,000 barrels of oil a day starting now. Uh, of course, the first strategy would benefit oil companies, and the second strategy would benefit the American people. So that may explain who supports what. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rome. And our final witness uh, is uh, Mr. Uh, Jim May. Uh, Mr. May is the President and CEO of the Air Transport Association, the nation's oldest and largest airline trade association. Uh, Mr. May has been with ATA since 2003. Um, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would, uh, I would note that one of the first things I did within two weeks of joining ATA in 2003 was to ask for a release from the SPRO, where the publicly before the Senate uh, Energy Committee. So there is a little bit of precedent to our position. Uh, first, thank you and the other members of Congress and the committee uh, for your leadership in assuring that we do not continue to fill the SPRO at uh, these extraordinary prices. Uh, I don't have to convince you that high oil prices are smothering our nation's families, taking an especially heavy toll on aviation, but also trucking and agriculture and hospitality industry and other key uh, sectors that help drive the U.S. economy. Uh, this morning, oil was trading at about 126 and change versus $75 a year ago. That's well over $4 a barrel for American families. I would also note for you that uh, due to limited refining capacity and global demand, jet fuel, Jet A, which we burn, costs as much as $30 a barrel more than gasoline. So we've been paying a, you know, upwards of $170 a barrel, uh, which is uh, significantly greater than in 2007. In fact, we're going to spend $62 billion as an industry domestically this year on fuel. That's about $20 billion more and accounts for the $10 billion we're projected to lose uh, in this uh, calendar year. To give you a perspective on a per consumer basis, we're spending today about seven cents per mile for each of the passengers that we carry. That's a fuel bill of about $420 uh, per person. And when you consider that our average a round trip ticket across all classes and all distances is probably in the range of uh, four to five hundred dollars. Uh, you begin to get an appreciation for how difficult an equation we're trying to deal with. And deal with it we are, but not in happy ways. We've cut 32,000 jobs, over 100 communities have lost service or will lose service, uh, and you know, it is having a devastating effect on the economy. There are a lot of reasons. We've talked about them this morning. The weak dollar increasing demand in, in uh, developing economies, uh, insufficient exploration and refining capacity, geopolitical instability, and all of those things. Uh, I would suggest to you that there are also a number of solutions. Uh, in, in no particular order, increasing domestic supply, conservation alternative fuels is critical to the future. Reining in unchecked speculation, a subject that we've become well known for talking about for some period of time is critical. And I think a third component, the third leg of that stool, if you will, is a release from the strategic reserve. Now, increasing our domestic supplies uh, will reduce our dependence on foreign oil, help lower prices. I think a release from the SPRO is a good first step. We have 706 million barrels. It's over 97 percent full. We suggest, as the, sec as the uh, speaker has, that a 10 percent release, which is roughly 70 million barrels, would make a very market increase. You've heard the testimony this morning about pricing. Uh, when uh, President Bush did it back during Desert Storm, it was about a 38 percent drop. 
I would suggest a framework for that release. One, uh, if it's going to be released, don't let people know in advance. Don't let the markets know in advance. Just do it on a timed basis. Two, make sure it's light, sweet, crude, not uh, sour that's being released. Three, uh, restore U.S. commercial inventories. They're down about 58 to 60 million barrels, and that, that roughly equates to the 70, 10 percent that we're suggesting. And finally, uh, two things. Dedicate the revenue, as has been suggested this morning, to uh, development of alternative fuels. Uh, we're working on biofuels projects for aviation use, for example, and set up a framework for continuing to do this as conditions dictate. Triggers, targets, something of that sort that would be worthwhile. So as I said, we, we think the uh, speaker's proposal on a 10 percent release would be, would be appropriate and positive. I would also note that there is another reserve, it's the New England uh, Heating Oil Reserve, which could uh, be worthy of consideration for a release and then a refill before the winter comes. And finally, Mr. Chairman, um, let me reiterate what, what, I, what I started with. We think this is a three-legged stool. We think that rather than engaging in an exercise in who's to blame for high fuel prices, Congress ought to immediately embark on a program of how we can share credit for solving the high fuel prices. We need more supply. The Republicans introduced a package yesterday that many in the majority party won't like, but I think it is absolutely worth consideration. Uh, two, I think, as I've said before, the Speaker's plan on releasing from the SPRO, and three, Mr. Stupak's Pump Act, which I think does a terrific job of trying to attack rampant speculation in the marketplace. We need all three and any other solution. We've got thousands of people out of work, more are coming, more communities are going to lose service, and we need the Congress to address this before the August recess, if at all possible. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. May, very much. <clears throat> and now we'll turn to uh, questions from the uh, committee uh, members. Uh, Mr. May, the, one of the arguments that is made about the deployment of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is that uh, we're not in an emergency. Uh, what does the airline industry have as a response to that assertion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, there are at least 32,000 families who have had a breadwinner that's lost a job uh, in my industry that would suggest this is absolutely an emergency. I would suggest all of those communities that are losing service, uh, the people who can't move as efficiently and rapidly around the country, uh, would suggest this is a, an emergency. I, I support the continued use of the SPRO. I think from a strategic, tactical perspective, it's important. But I think there are also times when it ought to be used to address the economic emergency that exists in this country. And, and so I would suggest to you there is ample reason to have a controlled release. Mr. Rome, Mr. Simpson, you both worked at the Department of Energy. Do, does the economic condition that we are now being confronted with qualify under the law as a, a situation where the President could deploy the Strategic Petroleum Reserve? Mr. Simpson? Under the, under the, the law, the definition of a, uh, is really somewhat vague. It can be interpreted in, in many different ways. There is a strong reluctance to use uh, economic concerns. But the definition of an emergency uh, as a result of, of inadequate supplies uh, can be fairly broad. And the flexibility uh, that the Secretary has to do emergency or test drawdowns, test sales, uh, different types of things is fairly discretionary. So I, if, if Mr. May's definition of an emergency is people losing jobs, um, I think that could be part of the definition. Do you agree with that, Mr. Rome? <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, I would also add that if you had described current conditions today to us uh, in the Clinton administration and, and said, would you release the SPRO now, I, I think everybody absolutely would have. I mean, we debated it under a situation that was far more mild than it is today. What, that's, what that's uh, Mr. Simpson, what are the uh, 
if any, operational uh, obstacles to the deployment of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in the shot run? Um, I don't think there are any uh, operational obstacles to releasing it. Uh, the implications of an exchange that I talked about uh, would be uh, actually positive in the long term for the reserve because we would begin to make the, the capacity of the oil in the reserve uh, more reflect the 40 percent of the refining uh, industry's use of heavy oil. I think we're in, we have, uh, we're, we're in jeopardy here. We've got a hurricane coming in and down in Texas. If it had turned south and gone in, into Mexico and disrupted uh, some of the heavy oil production uh, down there, we wouldn't have a way to replace that heavy oil using the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. So you're saying releasing light crude now and replacing it with heavy crude is something which is consistent with industry practices and needs? Very much so. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, uh, Mr. Rome, we've already seen a disruption of heavy oil imports from Latin America under uh, Hugo Chavez's regime in 2002. Both GAO and the Department of Energy have concluded that including some amount of heavy oil in the SPR would, uh, uh, would be wise. Uh, do you agree with that uh, conclusion, Mr. May, that uh, Mr. Simpson just uh, reached? I'm, I'm not sure I followed the question, Mr. Chairman. Do I agree with which statement? The statement that Mr. Simpson just made, that having more heavy crude would actually be something that could Yeah, I, I, I'm not an expert on heavy versus light. I can tell you this, that, that to the extent you're releasing light, you're making it available to all of the refineries in the United States. There are a number of refineries that cannot process uh, heavy sour, and, and so Replacing that with heavy sour is a, is a perfectly sound strategy, and releasing light sweet will have the most immediate impact on uh, the refineries all being able to use it and uh, for the consumer to get gasoline, jet A, diesel fuel, et cetera. Okay, now, let me just conclude by asking this question of each of you quickly. Uh, if we did pass legislation which said to the President, deploy 10 percent of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve over the next uh, five or six months without telling him which day of the week to do it. Uh, but if there was something happening in Iran or Nigeria, other parts of the world, he could deploy a million barrels of oil on the couple of days before uh, or after that incident and maybe not deploy anything for uh, a week or so after that. Uh, would that have, in your opinion, a downward pressure on the price uh, of oil if the President had that authority uh, and had to deploy 70 million barrels over a five or six month period. Mr. Simpson. Uh, I believe it would, and in looking at the history, I think that's, that's the case. If you add the, the government as a player, uh, and there are people who advocate both sides, but if you have to put the government in as a player, it, cr it makes it more difficult to accurately predict as speculators would like to do, what the oil price would be in the future. Dr. Rome? I would agree with that. I mean, obviously, it assumes that the President would make use of that authority. But if the President were willing to make use of the authority, I don't think it would have any question that it would, uh, it would have a downward pressure on prices. Mr. May? It would have a downward pressure. Okay. Thank you. My time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Simpson, I want to begin with you to ask some questions about your knowledge of prior, prior drawdowns. In your testimony, how many drawdowns did you cover or, or, or in your analysis? Uh, four. Four. In each of those instances, prices fell? Yes. Um, can you tell me what the percentage re reduction was each time of the overall SPRO? 5 percent, 30 percent, 50 percent? It was not, uh, I'd have to go back and look at the math, but it was in the range, let's say they offered 34 million barrels in 1991, and we had about, um, I think, about nearly 600 million barrels in the reserve at that time. So it would have been a, a um, you know, a 5 percent reduction. Um, Do you recall if any of them were more than the 10 percent, which Mr. May has expressed support for? Uh, no, they have not been. Okay. You, you said that the current law is vague, and the vagueness goes to the issue of whether it's supposed to be used for a military emergency, I take it, versus an economic situation like we face now. Is that right? Actually, it's usually viewed as a, as a supply disruption. Uh, it's been used uh, in, in, the, in 91, it was a military. In 2005, it was a hurricane. 
Mr. Rome uh, testified that um, he could see no circumstance under which our supply of foreign oil could be cut off. Um, uh, a closing of, apparently not the closing of the Straits of Hormuz, nor a war with Iraq, nor a war with, the, with whoever in the Middle East, uh, that under no circumstance, because we have a world market, that our supply would be either cut off or dramatically reduced. At least that is what I understood him to say. I will ask him in just a moment. Um, uh, would you agree with that? There are circumstances where the global supply could be diminished, where a circumstance where U.S. supply could be cut off I don't think exists. <laughs> um, right. It could be reduced but not cut off. Right. Presumably. Um, is there a safe, in your mind, or an unsafe level of drawdown that we could do? 10 percent would be safe given what might happen to us uh, that we don't anticipate versus uh, 90 percent might be unsafe, or, or do you think it doesn't matter? Um, I think the way the reserve is put together, that if you talk about a 10 percent reduction and if some of the proposals that I have heard, we would never actually be 10 percent short. If you look at the reserve and look, so just pick, pick West Hackberry or Bryan Mound, they are comprised of many different caverns. And so you could draw uh, one cavern down. Uh, draw another one down, then begin to replenish it Fair as enough. market conditions play. I need to get to Mr. Rom. Mr. Rom, did I misstate your position? Well, I, I thought I heard you say, as a matter of fact, I took notes that there just is no circumstance under which uh, we would need to draw it greater than now. I, and I presume that means even a war or even a cutting off of the Straits of Hormuz. Well, what I tried to say was I ask people to describe me the scenario. I have never heard a plausible scenario. I mean, if you shut down the Straits of Hormuz, I mean, I guess it would depend uh, on the circumstances, but obviously the price of oil would skyrocket immediately, and I'm not certain the Strategic Petroleum Reserve would have any impact. Uh, I mean, uh, Mr. We, but in 30 years, we've never released more than 30 million barrels, so it's, it's very hard to say uh, sometime in the near future we're going to need 500 million barrels to, be, to release. It's just there's no historical evidence that any circumstance like that would ever happen. Mr. May, uh, as I understand your testimony, it is essentially all of the above. Uh, we, at least a three-legged stool. We Mr. need to be doing Chairman, everything that, we can. That is, that is correct. We support the uh, continued existence of the SPRO, but we think a 10 percent drawdown would be positive economic news. Uh, we think that supply side has to be part of the equation. You and I have talked about that many times in the past, and we think that there, there has to be a strong, credible, no-nonsense approach to speculation in the marketplace and think that Mr. Stupak's bill uh, does a terrific job of addressing that. Um, you did, uh, two quick points, and then I want to have a follow-up question, Mr. May. You did note that the price of oil dropped $16 roughly following the President's announcement that— Yes, sir. It's, it's all due to ATA's efforts on speculation. Congratulations. <laughs> Appreciate that. I don't really care what I'm with you. I don't care what the cause is. I just I want it. I now. don't either. I just and and I want to give everybody credit. I don't want any for us. I just want to get the prices down. I like the idea. Let me ask you for one more piece of advice. Let's say that uh, uh, we pass legislation now uh, directing, say, a 10 percent reduction in the SPRO, and we also pass the Pump Act. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Stupak uh, had a witness at his hearing. Uh, who I believe has advised your industry, who said that if the Pump Act were to pass, uh, his testimony was price, the price of oil would drop by 50 percent in 30 days. Mr. Stupak himself being somewhat more humble and afraid that, that that might not be true, on the floor last week said that he believed that the Pump Act were to, draw, were to be passed and signed into law. And for the purpose of my question, let's assume it is. So we do the SPRO and we do the Pump Act. Mr. Stupak said the price of oil would drop by 30 percent in 30 days. My question of you is, let's assume we do both of those before the August break to help the American people. And let's assume that, well, let's give Mr. Supak uh, and the SPRO time to work. Let's say 45 days from now, the price of oil is, only, is not down at all. What would you then suggest we do? Uh, Mr. Shattuck, uh, at that point, if, if, first of all, I very strongly believe that if you do both of those things, it will have a huge impact downward impact on prices. If, God forbid, it doesn't, then I think you've got to go the supply side, even though it may have a minimal short-term effect, and there is going to be some short-term effect as well as long-term. 
I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not smart enough to know beyond that what else there is to do. Do you buy the 30 to 50 percent figure? I don't know that I buy 30 to 50 percent, but, but I, what I do buy is most of the experts suggesting that the normalized cost of production, which is the fancy term for what should oil sell for today in a real world market, supply and demand being what it is, China, India, dollar, et cetera, is probably about 75 to 80 bucks a barrel. And if it's trading at 126 this morning, then we've got a long way to go to get there. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is for uh, Dr. Rahm. You know, when I go back to my district, people say, well, why do we not have uh, more supply available and why are we not drilling? What would your response be to average person on the street about what that means? I mean, um, clearly we have to articulate that what you said earlier about drilling, that uh, the, those supplies won't be made available for another 20 years. What are some good things that we could be telling our constituents about the reality of what's really happening out well, there? Well, I think people need to understand that it, it is, you know, it took us two or three decades to get into this mess. Uh, certainly many of us have been urging for quite some time that we need a much more aggressive strategy on fuel efficiency and alternative fuels. I'm not certain that's a lot of comfort uh, to your constituents. I certainly would tell them that in 2006, Congress opened up most of the Gulf of Mexico uh, to drilling. And according to the Energy Information Administration, the Bush administration's <coughs> own EIA, <coughs> there's about 41 billion barrels there. Uh, <coughs> and we've gotten that, we've found about 7 billion in the last two years. Um, now the, the coastal drilling, I don't know what else to call it, because I think the public is confused. They think we're not drilling offshore. We are doing a lot of drilling and exploring offshore. Um, According to the IA, there's about 18 billion barrels, uh, which is a lot less than what's in the Gulf. Uh, and it should be pointed out that of the 18 billion that the moratorium applies to, 10 billion is off of California. And I think if we left it up to the state of California, there probably we wouldn't be doing any drilling. So we're not talking about much oil. And I think the notion that if we opened up 40 billion barrels in 2006 to be drilled, and since then oil prices have doubled, the possibility that if you ended the moratorium to a lot less oil, anything would happen to oil prices is absurd. And I think it is incumbent upon political leaders like yourself to just give uh, the public straight talk. Um, I understand that the higher oil prices are, the more people believe, hey, we should, we should drill more. We are drilling flat out. We have been, and I'm sure you have the statistics, the, the Congress, the White House has been opening up land onshore and offshore for drilling. I wanted to change the subject a little bit. We, we talk about uh, gearing up for renewable energy, new technologies. We, we had a bill signed into law by the President last year our energy bill that included uh, green uh, job, the Green Jobs Act. Can you give me some insight there about how this plays into uh, getting our dependency off of fossil fuels and what that means? And maybe also Mr. May could talk a little bit about that too because of your industry and how you are driven and, and how, how this transition may impact your, uh, your area. So very quickly. <laughs> sure, well, I think it's very clear. This year, we're going to send $700 billion. American consumers are going to spend $700 billion o overseas to purchase oil. And, and as, as T. Boone has said, there is no prospect that that number is going to be lower for the next 10 years. That's going to be $7 trillion. Obviously, it would make a great deal of sense to spend money in this country on plug-in hybrids, wind power, solar photovoltaics, energy efficiency, and keep the money uh, in America paying people to do insulation, to build better cars, et cetera, than to send trillions of dollars overseas. So that the is- The criticism we get, though, if I could just quickly sure. say, is that we're actually going to decrease the number of jobs here at home. So, so um, that's an argument that is being used by the other side of the aisle against us now, that if we reinvest, it's going to take away from those jobs that currently exist. Like, well, we're importing almost, you know, about two-thirds of our oil. So $700 billion out of, let's say, a trillion we're going to spend on oil this year is just going to go to Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's just going to go to Venezuela. It's going to go to Russia. It's going to make, create jobs in those countries. I don't see how that $700 billion can do anything for Americans. If we could spend 
a couple trillion dollars over the next 10 or 20 years, invest in this country, and then reduce that from $700 billion to a couple hundred billion dollars, we'd be bringing back a half a trillion dollars each year, keeping it in this country. I just think it, it makes obvious sense that that is the way to economic health and well-being. Mr. May, just quickly, I know what my time's run out. Um, I think that two quick points to make. Number one, the aviation uh, space, the aviation sector uh, feels that being environmentally sound is in its own best interest for one very simple reason. We are totally carbon intensive right now in terms of our fuel, and so the less we burn, the more environmentally friendly we're going to be, and we are desperate to spend uh, less money on fuel in whatever way we can. Next generation air traffic control, you know, winglets, we can go down a long list of things that we're working on. I'd in love to hear more about what that cost would mean or, or uh, investment oh. that would be made. We'll, we'll be happy to provide that to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, the gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry, excuse, excuse me. I, I, recognize yeah, I thought um, the gentleman Oregon. from Oregon had. Uh, I'm sorry, excuse <laughs> me. The sorry. gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, excuse me. Thank you. Well, I, w I wanted to follow up on Ms. Solis's point uh, because it seems to me that saving a quarter trillion, half a trillion dollars, reinvesting it here, helping. Uh, the United States move from a position where we waste more energy than any country in the world to uh, being ready for the next generation of generation. Um, and I wanted to start, Mr. May, just if we were to have 10, 20, 30, 40 billion dollars over the course of the next five years that we can accelerate uh, investments in helping industries like yours uh, reduce your carbon footprint. Sure. Uh, what impact could that potentially make? If there's an extra, say, $10 billion available to right. uh, subsidize uh, a new generation of, uh, of uh, aircraft, retiring the elements of the fleet that may not be necessary because of changing uh, uh, configurations of the market? What? Well, the, the, Congressman, the reality is we're in an economic crisis. We're going to lose $10 billion this year. That's $10 billion we're not going to invest in uh, new Boeing aircraft, for instance, uh, or uh, a, a number of other changes. So, uh, you know, trying to figure out what sort of uh, national investment needs to be made, I think, should be a high priority. And it ranges from... Uh, more money going into the development of biofuels, biomass. Boeing has a project they, de they debuted at the uh, Farnsboro Air Show, show uh, just this last week, to uh, environmentally sensitive CTL, to a whole range of different technologies. Next generation, air traffic control can save us billions and billions of dollars and, and, and yeah. hundreds of millions of metric tons of CO2. Uh, in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the course of a, of a plane trip, mm -hmm. uh, is the takeoff and the landing the most energy intensive part of the trip? I'm going to guess it is, uh, Congressman Blumenauer, but I'm not sufficiently expert to, to answer that with, could I, without could, doubt. I can I, get an answer I, for I, you. I would appreciate uh, your uh, information, your reference uh, that uh, it's costing seven cents per passenger mile for fuel for today, fuel. Uh, I am interested in the, in how that varies in terms of trip distance. Uh, that 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 figure is an average figure I across understand. all, but I'll get you the detail. Great, thank you very much. Um, I am uh, uh, interested in in this this notion about uh, a, a sustained drawdown for a while. If we don't need uh, 706 uh, million barrels of oil. And I think uh, I'm not quite where you are yet, Dr. Ohm, but uh, I do think there's strong evidence that uh, we could get by with hundreds of uh, millions of barrels less, that that were 
transitioned into the fuel supply system so that there is something that's sustainable over the next two or three years. And concurrently, the revenue that is generated from that uh, would be available to help the transition of technologies, to bump this up, that it would be sort of a double benefit. I mean, I still am stunned that a 2 percent world increase in demand uh, has, uh, over the course of the last year, we have seen prices double. There is something going on in terms of speculation and market manipulation, it seems to me, without question. Uh, but using the SPRO and a significant amount of it for reinvestment as a longer term strategy so that we have a three to five year bridge uh, that we can make a difference. I am wondering if, if uh, you would care to comment on that notion. Sure. Well, we could sell 500,000 barrels of oil a day for four years and run through the entire SPRO. So you can sort of decide for yourself how much of the SPRO you think we need. Uh, it's hard for me to believe we need even half of the current SPRO. Uh, again, we've, if, we had ha if the SPRO were half as big as it is now, it would still be 10 times the size of the amount of oil we have ever released during crises. So you know, running half a million barrels of oil a day for two years obviously uh, would have an impact on prices and would generate a lot of revenue uh, to, make, to you know, jump start the clean energy transition. But, uh, you can ask Kyle's opinion. Yeah, I, I disagree somewhat with Joe. I, I do think we need to have a strong, uh, robust strategic petroleum reserve. I do, however, think we ought to use it. Um, I, it seems silly to have an investment of that magnitude in the ground and not be willing to use it for things like helping to pay for the transition, the R&D that we need for the next generation of clean energy right, technology. But just would you feel comfortable if we were making a, a strategic allocation of 100 to 200 million barrels over the next two to five years as we are trying to work this through? Is that something that is within your comfort level, absent some other development? I, I don't know that I would go that big. I like the idea of this, of this exchange. Okay. I think the exchange works. Uh, what we suggested in testimony, Congressman, is that you set up a framework for how it would be used. You may set target prices, uh, fill below a certain level, as the Congress has already directed, uh, release above a certain price level. Uh, use it as a safety mechanism to balance out uh, what is going on. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Now, the gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Rahm, I was actually quite, uh, I don't say startled, but surprised by your prediction that the SPR would be gone uh, by mid-century. Uh, my personal feeling, uh, I think, uh, lies more with Mr. Simpson. We ought to keep that around for specific for the kind of purpose that we need it for today, to keep the market speculation in check. Uh, and you've shown with your testimony that, geez, that's been done a couple of times in the past. It works. Why don't we keep some of this stuff around just for that purpose, if nothing else? Um, but uh, I believe that we're that there's a sufficient supply of oil out there today. Uh, I'm not talking about five years from now or ten years from now, but there's a sufficient supply of oil out there today, and the SPR can be used to start um, a a, a medium-term drop in the oil prices. Do you all agree with that, that, that the SPR can be used in, in the light of an uh, adequate supply today to, to initiate a medium-term drop in, in prices? I, I, I believe it can. And I think that you can, if, if you do it right, you can help also address the next problem, which is we need to get off of oil. So if you use the Strategic right. Petroleum Reserve to help keep the prices in, in a reasonable band, whatever that may be, and use the money that is generated to help develop the technology to move us on to the next generation, then it is serving the dual purpose. Uh, look, could I just say, sure. imagine what happens if we don't use it now. That means we are sending a signal to the market that there is never going to be a price or economic reason we will ever release it. So that is just going to encourage the speculators, hey, they have got all this oil there, never going to use. It is just crazy, really. Well. Uh, I see uh, the Strategic Petroleum Re Reserve being used to, to decrease the price. I think that is going to happen maybe in the next uh, presidency. But uh, what I don't want to see is that 
uh, since we're at importing, what, 60 to 70 percent of our oil, we're still a very high risk for our economy, for our future. But fortunately, we have the technology coming out today uh, with plug-in hybrids, with all electric vehicles that uh, if the Fed does its job in encouraging the American consumers to become efficient, within a decade or so, we'll see most new vehicles being plug-in hybrids or all electric and the whole oil price issue will be a non-issue like it is today. Uh, I mean, I think that's perfectly within the realm of possibility. Do you agree with that? Um, I agree with half of that. Okay. Uh, I just think that what is happening in China and India means that uh, if we did make this aggressive switch to plug-in hybrids, we would shield the American consumer from high oil prices. But I don't know that we would lower oil prices, because demand is just going to grow as you see the urbanization and industrialization uh, of the developing world. My reason for advocating the transition to clean energy and plug-in hybrids is that fuel is substantially cheaper than gasoline. So if you own a plug-in hybrid, you don't care, really, what the price of gasoline is. Um, I would hope if we could get China and India to transition over to electric vehicles and clean energy, then we might be able to bring the price of oil down. Especially if we're manufacturing those items and sending them over there. But uh, So I, I think we're pretty much on agreement. If we get ahead of the efficiency curve, then uh, we're going to be insulated from the, high from the high prices that are inevitably going to come. Um, one other question. The Strategic Petroleum Reserve is there. It's a, it's a resource for us. Uh, is there a specific legislation that any one of you would recommend in terms of how we would uh, legislate using that in the future? Uh, there is a piece of legislation, uh, H.R. 6067, that was introduced by uh, Congressman Lamson and co-sponsored by the chairman and, and others on the committee uh, that would uh, uh, create a, would, would cause an exchange and then would reinvest any revenue that was gained as a result of the price differential between light and heavy crude to be invested in energy R&D uh, across the board that's been authorized by the Congress, but the money's not been available to fully fund those programs. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. May, it's good to see you again, sir. And uh, oh, I'm pleasure, interested Congress. to see that you uh, that ATA considers this an emergency. Uh, my constituents consider this current situation an emergency. In New York's 19th district, uh, I'm hearing from people who can't afford the gas to drive to a job interview. I'm hearing from school districts who are uh, wondering how they're going to power their buses and whether they'd be able to. Uh, or whether it be re required to reduce the number of bus runs by cramming kindergartners on the same bus with high schoolers uh, to save on diesel fuel. Uh, I'm hearing from families that are having to choose between uh, an extra, a third meal in a day and uh, gasoline. So as badly as the Gulf Coast was hit during Katrina, and not to diminish by any means the suffering that they are still going through down there uh, in the recovery, uh, the attempted recovery from Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. Nonetheless, the impression we have in New York, in the 19th District anyway, and, and that I hear from others around the country, is that as a whole, our economy is suffering more today than it was during and after Hurricane Katrina. The impact that there are, is being had by uh, the increase in gas prices on uh, the economy across the board, whether it's aircraft, uh, cost of goods that it's uh, being uh, increased, uh, difficulty in the tourism industry or the trucking industry or go on down the list is more widespread and more pervasive and more of a crisis than it was when we were hit by those two hurricanes in a row. So I would make the argument that this is a crisis and that there should be a release. I'm happy to hear all of you uh, saying that. And I guess the question is uh, how much over what period of time. Um, and I totally agree that using the uh, benefit, we're st we actually stand to, uh, for the first time maybe ever, have the taxpayer sell something that it bought earlier and make a profit at it. Uh, most of the oil there, I would guess we bought it less than $50 a barrel. About 30. About, about average around 30. So if we sell it at uh, you know, 120, 130, whatever it may be, it may come down a little bit when, once this starts to be known. 
it'll nonetheless be at least double what we paid for it. And it is, as uh, Mr. Simpson has said, an opportunity for us to use uh, this profit, whether it's a swap or an outright sale, uh, to bring renewable fuels and alternative fuels to market and start to get ourselves uh, an alternative, a competitor for oil. Last night, uh, T. Boone Pickens spoke to our caucus. I understand he also spoke to the Republican caucus as well. And uh, he has uh, a very interesting plan that he's heavily investing in, in, in himself, um, which is to uh, use the wind belt up the central part of the country from Texas uh, to the uh, Dakotas and, and uh, somewhat to each side, and both coasts as well. Uh, to produce enough electricity that we can replace the natural gas that's currently being used for power generation so that can be diverted to transportation. And uh, that much less liquid fuel used in our cars and trucks will mean more that can be used by the aviation industry and so on. I think that um, I see in my district, I mean, I've helped to build uh, with work gloves and a hard hat on down in the trench, helped to put in uh, geothermal systems that will cut uh, air conditioning costs to practically zero and cut heating costs in the winter and our latitude to about 50 percent of what, it, what they currently are. I could go on and on. You know the story between the, the air, uh, uh, the solar, the wind, the geothermal, the, the tidal power, uh, and so on. Uh, so the alternatives are there. I want to ask a question uh, which will probably use up the rest of my time. Uh, many of uh, my constituents are already being asked to make lock-in purchase agreements for home heating oil for this coming winter and are experiencing some serious sticker shock uh, uh, looking at $5 heating oil, whereas last year it was $2 or something. So how could a release from the SPR best help to take the edge off of home heating oil prices in addition to gasoline? And I would ask you, starting with Mr. Simpson, if you could each answer that, please. Well, I think you could go back to the, uh, the, the exchange that occurred in, in 2000, and it was precipitated by a concern about heating oil. At that, it was a physical shortage of heating oil that they were concerned about at that time. Um, but if you could uh, r release oil, have it refined into heating oil, uh, and and it's it's the price of the oil that's going to drive the cost of the heating oil. So if you if you put enough into the market that it did, that it does stop some of the speculation and allows the price to get back to what many have uh, suggested is a much lower price under the fundamentals, uh, there's time to do that before the winter heating season. Thank you. Well, I would just say you know if we released half a million barrels of oil a day for let's say six months. That should drop the price substantially, uh, and that would obviously benefit uh, uh, people who uh, dr drive cars, who fly planes, and, and who have to ho heat their homes with oil. If it didn't reduce the price of oil substantially, that would tell us something very important, which is that we are in a very big, long-term uh, supply-demand uh, mismatch, and we had better work really hard to do what T. Boone says. So I think we, you know, I, I just think that we should find out how much speculation, how much uh, uh, froth there is in the market versus how much the price is actual supply-demand trends, and releasing a fair chunk of oil from the SPRO would tell us that very quickly. Mr. May. Mr. Hall, um, I, I, I noted at the outset of my testimony that this is, this is not an issue that simply affects airlines or truckers or agriculture or retail or the hospitality industry, but consumers everywhere. And I think anything this Congress does, and I've recommended three legs to that stool, uh, anything you do to bring prices down is going to have a, a sweeping effect across the whole economy. And I think it will impact the, the constituents in Poughkeepsie uh, who are worried about home heating oil for the, for the winter. Uh, as it would in Wisconsin or any place else where it's particularly cold. And uh, it's going to make a difference for transportation. It's going to be uh, make a difference for the hotel and lodging industry that is having such a tough time because we're cutting back on the number of flights going to a lot of these different destinations. So I, I think the sooner the better, the more widespread, the more sweeping the relief that Congress can provide, the better. Thank you. Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank 
you very, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Now, technology has failed with microphones on the Republican side. I guess I should say I'm not surprised. But uh, 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 that that being said, you know, let me say that uh, re uh, release of crude oil from the SPRO is going to be temporary at best, um, and it will cool the futures market. There's no question about that. But if Dr. Rahm's fear is right, that uh, there is something more to this than speculation and a bubble that has been created, it seems to me that everybody's going to have to step back and look at what to do. And we've heard an awful lot of opposition led by the Speaker of the House on the other side of the aisle uh, against drilling anywhere. And I would hope that if there is a release from the SPRO and nothing happens relative to uh, immediate relief that is significant enough to make a, a, a dent in the economy for the better, then uh, uh, it's my hope that my friends over on the other side of the aisle will realize that drilling is a, at least a part of the answer. Uh, I think that we on our side of the aisle, most of us at least, myself included, know that drilling is not the exclusive answer, but we think it should be a part of the answer, and they don't. So uh, uh, the only observation that I would make is I think that releasing oil from the SPRO is worth a try. But if it doesn't work, uh, then we've got to do something more fundamental, and we ought to do it in September before this Congress adjourns sign a die. I yield back. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Pickens, T. Boone Pickens, uh, suggests that uh, unless we reduce our dependence on foreign oil, that, uh, that a barrel of oil uh, could rise to $300 a, a barrel. Uh, is, is that an exaggeration or do, you, do any of you uh, see that as uh, the next normal? Um, well, let me say, I don't think there's any question that uh, if we don't get off of our current path on oil, oil prices are headed much higher. And, and uh, the CIBC actually projects $200 a barrel of oil in two years. Um, so no, I don't think, I don't, whether it's, you know, two, 200, 250, 300, it's hard to say. Yeah. Over uh, 10 years is what he said I should have. Right. And over 10 years, I think that's reasonable. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, it, it's absolutely reasonable because, after all, it looks like current prices of oil aren't destroying demand or generating huge amounts of extra supply. And demand is just going to keep going up because of China, India, and other countries. So, you know, at some point, you, the price has to rise until demand is destroyed or there's a lot of more supply. One of those two things has to happen or else prices will just keep rising. Congressman, I'm going to take a, a, a somewhat different view. Uh, I, I think that um, my colleague is correct here in, in one respect. On the other hand, I, I think there's, there's, there's been great joy and sport taken in predicting 150, 200 and plus dollar oil. Uh, by a whole lot of folks in the trading community who are delighted to see the expectation of uh, increasing prices become a very profitable sideline. And uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not at all happy with, the, with, that, the, with that byproduct of this speculation uh, that, that is assisting in the process of driving prices up. I do think there is a speculative bubble. And I happen to believe that the marginal cost of production for oil is somewhere in the, in the uh, 65, 75, 85 dollar range, uh, and that it's, it's realistic to expect 100 dollar oil just as easily as it is 200 dollar oil. And uh, that's, a, that's a somewhat different view. Uh, Mr. Clear, I, one thing. It's kind of hard to argue with Boone Pickens with as much money as he's made and, and the predictions that he's made. Uh, I think the price could go up or the price could go down. But the one thing that we, we may not have a lot of control over that, but we've got tools that we can use to keep us from having to be in this situation. 
there are many technological advances that are either out there to be deployed or just over the horizon that if we can get some, some pressure released uh, by, by trying, and I thought Joe's point was great. If we release oil from the reserve and it works to drive prices down, great. If we release oil from the reserve and it doesn't work, that's a wake-up call. Yeah. And we've got to get out of this situation, and, and we have the tools to do that. What, what would be the, uh, a, a reasonable test period to see whether or not uh, the release of oil from the reserve is, is, is uh, uh, impactful on the economy? I mean, is it uh, for one uh, quarter, uh, do we, uh, should we wait a year? I mean, uh, if it if it if it doesn't drop the prices of uh, pr prices at the pump, uh, I mean, you think people are scared because of Freddie, Freddie Mac and and Fannie Mae? Uh, I mean, you, that would create generate a, I think a crisis in this country. I'm, I've I've changed my. I, I used to think we had a, a transportation based economy. I think we now have a confidence based economy. You know, if you don't, if, if the confidence of the public drops, we're in trouble. So uh, what period of time, I, mean, uh, I, I happen to support it, but I'm, I'm, I'm also at the same time uh, uh, frightened by the prospects of it not dropping the prices of, of oil. Could I just say that one of the reasons why no one ever uses the SPRO is that it's always argued in the highest levels of the government that that will show that the government is scared and it's a crisis and that's why we're, they're releasing the SPRO. So they never release the SPRO for that reason. And so, as I say, I personally think the SPRO is relatively useless. I would say three to six months. If, 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 the, if the president announced that he's going to sell half a million barrels a day for three to six months, and he started doing it and nothing happened, uh, then people should panic because that means T. Boone is probably right. And we are headed to 300 unless we really make a concerted effort to end our addiction to oil. And that, I think, would be worth knowing also. And, and I would say, I think three to six months, it, history shows that the, if the announcement is made, you see the reaction. And, and then you begin to, it, it takes time to get into the gasoline markets because it takes time to refine the product that, you, that you've already got. But I would also make an observation that I wouldn't say I'm going to release 500,000 barrels a day every day for the next three to six months. I'd say we're going to release a set amount of oil and make it 70 million barrels or 90 million barrels and then let that, that uncertainty as to when that oil is going to come out will further tamp, tamp down the markets. But if you, uh, and they might sell it all at once, uh, but they might trickle it out and let it go at different times. Uh, I apologize for being late. I, uh, I was in a, over at the house in another meeting. Um, so you may have already dealt with this, but uh, do you have any, any dates or times? I, I, I probably should know this when we deployed uh, the reserves uh, previously? You may have already talked about it. Sure, and, and uh, in 1991, uh, right before uh, Desert Storm, uh, and, and I will expand a little bit on what I said earlier. The President announced on January 16th that he was, we were going to attack Iraq and that uh, we were gonna release 34 million barrels from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. The next day, the price of oil dropped by 30, a third, $10. Um, I want to point out that that was not the only thing that caused that to happen. Uh, in October of the, of the previous year, after the, the invasion of Kuwait had, had occurred, uh, there was a test sale. The Secretary of Energy said, you know, we haven't used the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in a while. Not sure the companies really are aware of how to interact with us on this, so we're going to do a four million barrel test sale, which was a pretty good forecast that they were, that the government was going to use it. That actually helped dampen prices a bit in the fall, and then there was a, a coordinated effort with the International uh, Energy Agency, um, our allies going into the war, that. Uh, they released some oil. It was a coordinated effort. The president made his announcement, and the price just dropped. And they actually didn't sell the 34 million barrels. They only sold 17. But the markets stabilized. And then there's 1996, 
uh, when the Congress uh, directed the Department of Energy to sell 227 million barrels of oil to help balance the budget. Um, it was enacted into law, signed by the President, I think on April 26th. Prices of gasoline were rising dramatically, particularly in California. There had been a refinery fire and some other things that were a whole multitude of things coming in place. And President Clinton made an interesting decision. So it's smart to sell oil from the reserve. If you've got to raise $227 million, why not sell the oil as fast as you can while the prices are high and get value for the taxpayer back? It was a very good move. Coincidentally, the price of gasoline dropped the next day and continued to fall through October uh, of that year. Um, the heating oil exchange in 2000 is, is another example where there was a shortage. Uh, price dropped, I think, around 30 percent at that time. Uh, and then uh, after Hurricane Katrina, uh, even though the problem after Hurricane Katrina was more of a, a refining capacity problem, or at least equally a refining capacity problem, because the refineries got flooded out, as it was a lo loss of production, uh, the fact that they released oil from the, re announced the release of oil from the reserve caused the price to drop fairly dramatically. Can I ask one, one, one more question? It, I apologize, I, uh, but when we have people with your expertise here, I want to try to squeeze every drop from you. Uh, it, it, if, uh, and this is, I'm asking you to, to be swamis almost, I guess, but if, if the U.S. Uh, released from Strategic uh, Petroleum Reserve uh, 200 barrels, or 300 bar barrels, whatever, uh, some, a large number. And then Japan also announced that they were going to uh, release uh, a couple of hundred uh, thousand barrels. Uh, do you, uh, are, and, and our friends around the, the, the world, if we have any uh, left, uh, and they, I mean, would, would, do you think that that would have even a, 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 a greater impact and, and, and the success in dropping the price at the pump would be a, a lot more significant if more than the U.S. announced uh, a drop, uh, that they were going to release uh, um, the Strategic uh, Petroleum Reserve in, in large amounts? Well, it's worked in the past. So I would think the more oil you could put into the market, the better uh, the result would be. And again, I, I think the other impact would be is it would send a signal to the market that those reserves weren't, in fact, just dollar, you know, money stuffed under a mattress that was never going to be used, but in fact, we would actually use it for this very purpose. And as long as the market thinks we're never going to use it, then yes. the speculative bubble is just going to grow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I just wanted to ask one more question. And before I do, I wanted to, uh, with all due respect, uh, refute the statement by the ranking member that Democrats are against drilling. In fact, last week, I believe we voted for the Drill Act that attempted to make uh, uh, oil companies drill on the 68 million acres in the lower 48 and some of the 20 uh, million acres that are available in Alaska that uh, they are sitting on and not drilling on. Coincidentally, that same day, the administration announced a sale of 2.6 million acre lease sale of 2.6 million acres in the uh, NPRA in Alaska, which obviously they could have done last week or last year or five years ago, whenever we were not stopping them. Uh, and we are, are uh, absolutely for drilling on the land that is uh, already leased and there's plenty of that. Um, but the question I have here goes to refining capacity. Uh, it's my understanding that, that there was one application in the last 30 years in this uh, country for a refinery. It was granted and that refinery was never built. Uh, is that accurate to your knowledge? Uh, there haven't been any refineries built in, in the last 30 years. I think that's right. Uh, but not, it's, it's not for because the applications are being denied. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily. It's a very complicated, obviously, process to, to, to do an, a, a green build of a, of a refinery. It is also not true that we have less refining capacity than, we have actually a lot more refining capacity than we did 30 years ago. There's, it's been expansion expansions of existing right. facilities. I just quickly, because we're over time already, but I just wanted to 
say my understanding is that our refineries are today are running at just below 90 percent. Does that sound? That sounds about right. About right. So to be clear, um, given the market calming impact and supply increasing impact of a release from the SPR, there should not be any credence to arguments that a lack of re refining capacity would mitigate the effect of an SPR release. Uh, that that's true because you're releasing oil into a global, even though that oil would stay in the United States, it means there's some oil that would not then have to come in here that could go to other places and it would have a global effect. Thank you. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that refining capacity doesn't stand in the way of a release from the SPR right. having the desired effect. And um, I want to thank you all for your, uh, for your testimony and yield back. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Uh, the, the, uh, the acting chairman just departed. He has a bill on the floor, which makes me the acting chair and the ranking member. I'm all powerful now. <laughs> and, uh, Who better? Uh, yeah. I mean, this is, this is, I've been waiting for this for years. Uh, but uh, but uh, if 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 we can, you know, maybe close out the the the, the uh, this session by uh, looking. Let's look at the other side of, of of all of the things we've been talking about. Uh, there are those who would suggest that because uh, uh, oil is uh, finite, that we are foolish to release the strategic petroleum reserve. Uh, and think that we'll drop the oil prices and that everything is going to be fine, everybody's going to be happy, divorces will be reduced, Every, life is, is good again. And uh, the truth of the matter is um, we, we, we are dealing with a finite uh, uh, substance and, and that uh, the next generation will, will deal with this problem unless we deal with it. Uh, there are some things happening. Um, Consumption has dropped. Uh, Americans are uh, grudgingly moving from the the twelve cylinder cars. Uh, uh, Amtrak ridership is up. Uh, in my community, the the uh, area transportation authorities buses uh, are increasing their ridership. Uh, the, uh, uh, the the big bus companies in the country are are riding. In fact, some of the Amtrak lines. Uh, are, are sold out of seats uh, of, because of people making long-term plans for uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. I mean, they're selling out uh, on Amtrak uh, all the way into December. Uh, and deaths, uh, automobile deaths are, are down because uh, people are not driving. I mean, you, you look at, at, at a number of the indicators and you think, well, you know, maybe Americans need to face the reality that uh, prices at the pr pump, uh, you know, are not going to go down, and, and our society would be better off if they didn't, because we can now start doing what we should have done. Um, is that too tough a, a, a philosophy? I mean, you're not going to expect any candidate to say that, but uh, in, in reality, just in here where nobody is listening, what? what <laughs> Do you what do you think? That on? Well, let me. Obviously, we have squandered the last two or three decades, and all the analyses show is that you know cars last twenty years, and and uh, behavior patterns become very ingrained. So yes, um, if you want to get off of our current path, you have to work really hard for ten, fifteen years, like T. Boone Pickens or Vice President Gore has said. Uh, otherwise, oil prices are, are, are headed up. I think the American public has figured that out, which is why they're buying different cars and changing their behavior. Um, I don't view that as an argument not to sell off the SPRO. I mean, if, and I just repeat what I said in my testimony, one of two things will happen. Either oil prices will drop or they won't. If they drop, that's a good thing. The SPRO has worked. If they don't, then we've learned that we're in a very big problem that, in fact, it is, we're at peak oil. Mm -hmm. um, or near it, which I think is actually the case, in which case it will be incumbent on, on Congress to take the very strong action that people have been urging to finally end our addiction to oil. So, yeah, I think the American consumers need to get used to $4 oil, and it will then be 5 6 7 unless their, their representatives, re, you know, take pretty strong action to reverse course. 
And I would just add to that, a release from the, from the reserve is not going to be a permanent solution. It has not been in history, and it won't be again. But we've, we've, when we're in an era now where prices are, are higher. It is remarkable to me the number of new energy technologies that are coming out at, at, at these, and the pace at which they're coming. And to see T. Boone Pickens come out and pr propose what, what he proposed is, is, is fairly remarkable. But I think we've been in a high price situation for a long enough time now that we're beginning to see a transition in the way American consumers think. They are buying smaller cars. Uh, they're parking the Tahoes. They're 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 taking mass transit, uh, if, improving the efficiency of their homes, uh, which is a, a very useful thing. And but there's no reason to to put them at the uh, mercy of those who would drive the price up higher than the market fundamentals would be. The price is not going to fall back down to a point where I think we're going to see a just oh gee that was a bad six months. Congressman, at the risk of prolonging this, um, I, th I think the equation is real simple. The longer you debate this, the longer you talk about it, the more people that are going to lose their jobs, the more communities that are going to lose service, it's time to have the Congress do something, and as quickly as possible, because it is a crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we appreciate you coming, uh, uh, and uh, we'll, since no, I'm the power here, we're going to increase your honorariums for appearing before this uh, uh, committee. Uh, and we appreciate, I think all members will have a time to uh, uh, submit remarks uh, to the chairman for our records. We appreciate very much your, your time, and I appreciate your, your talent. Uh, uh, you're very informative and appreciate it very much, and uh, hopefully we will act uh, quickly. Uh, that's one of the th positives we've gotten from this uh, hearing today. Thank you very much. Thank Meeting you. is adjourned.